Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Mark Finley. I'm the fellow in Energy and Global Oil, for those of you who don't know me. Uh, and uh, we have a great uh, conversation lined up today. Um, as part of our regular series of oil market, energy market updates here at the Baker Institute. Now, it's only been two months since our last oil and energy market update, but the occasion today was just too interesting to pass up. In financial markets, people talk about a triple witching hour when a variety of financial instruments all expire on the same day. And it's a confluence of events that can be the occasion for crazy things to happen. And that's the type of rare combination of events that we're looking at in the oil market over the next couple of days. We have a meeting of the OPEC plus group on Sunday. On Monday, the EU's embargo on most crude oil purchases from Russia takes effect. And at the same time, the group of seven countries, including the US and the EU, uh, are slated to put into, a, into effect a price cap on Russian oil sales. Now, any one of these events could have significant implications for the oil market in its own right. And as we will discuss, the close stacking of these events is not accidental. And this momentous weekend comes toward the end of a pretty remarkable year. World crude oil is on track to see one of the biggest annual average price increases ever, as are gasoline and even more so diesel, as we have discussed in some of our earlier webinars. Indeed, the last time yearly inflation-adjusted oil prices increased by at least $25 a barrel in each of two consecutive years was 1863 and 1864. Thank goodness for the BP Statistical Review. So this is kind of not a typical circumstance that we find ourselves in in the oil market uh, to begin with. The Russian invasion of Ukraine in February roiled global markets for many commodities, including oil. Here in the US and around the world, spiking energy prices have impacted economic growth, inflation, consumer pocketbooks, and therefore domestic politics and international relations. I suppose it's a sign of how the shale revolution has changed our world. But here in the US, annual domestic supply growth of over a million barrels a day has been seen as a disappointment. President Biden visited a country he'd vowed to make a pariah. Russia has used natural gas exports for political leverage in Europe, and as we will see, is threatening to do the same with oil globally, even as the US EU and their allies try to turn the oil weapon against Russia. So much going on. And we have a great panel to shed light on it in this very timely discussion. Toro Bosoni leads the IEA's influential monthly oil market report. Christoph Ruhl is a fellow at Columbia's Center for Global Energy Policy. And among his many interesting previous roles, served as the World Bank's chief economist in Moscow. So I'm going to begin today's webinar with a review of where the OPEC Plus Group is at the moment and some thoughts on Sunday's meeting prospects. Then Toral will review oil market context and prospects for the EU's crude embargo against Russia. And then Christoph will add comments on the G7 price cap. Um, and an article that he's written on that effect will be posted in a link to our website, as will the slides after the fact. Um, I'll then moderate a discussion of all this, including your questions, which you can enter using the Q&A button on the screen. With that, let me turn to the OPEC Plus meeting that is coming up on Sunday. So I think the first point to make is that, oops, am I sorry, am I, uh, sorry, technological issues, I'm sorry, folks. <laughs> Here we go. Um, the first point to make is that this meeting is actually taking place on a Sunday. Um, here's what we know so far. You know, the OPEC plus group, um, what I'm showing you here is the official group target for the OPEC plus group. And this is the group that includes traditional OPEC, with exceptions for countries that aren't party to the quota agreement, like Iran and Venezuela and Libya, 
plus the 10 additional participating countries that have been joining the group in coordinating production since about 2016, including importantly, Russia. You all know that the group implemented a large production cut of on paper, 2 million barrels a day to take effect November 1st. Um, this was a, meet, a, a, a agreement that was announced at the group's meeting in early October um, and is slated to take a, uh, to stay in effect through the end of 2023 with the obvious caveat that things will change as the group changes uh, its, its, its mind. But here's the key point for today's discussion. Here's actual production from the group uh, so far. And you know, we don't have official uh, estimates for November yet. Uh, but what we uh, you know, can see is that the group has been consistently underproducing relative to its production targets. And in fact, in October, was about three and a half million barrels a day below the official target. And where is that shortfall taking place? Well, the biggest contributor is Russia, uh, where production you know, has consistently fallen short of the official group's target. But we see that it's actually a fairly widely spread phenomenon. A number of participating countries are unable to even produce at their official target um, you know, due to a combination of domestic unrest, lack of investment, maturity of fields, as well as political and geopolitical considerations. Um, and what that means is that when it comes time to actually cut a 2 million barrel a day cut on paper, is likely to translate into a significantly smaller cut in real world. Here's just my, my theoretical exercise of, you know, which countries are capable of, of cutting production. Uh, in the sense that who was already producing at levels that were consistent with a need to cut production to stay aligned with targets in November. And essentially, it's the main producers in the Gulf, led by Saudi Arabia. And indeed, early reports suggest that uh, these countries have indeed followed through on their promises to cut production by roughly in aggregate a million barrels a day uh, in November. Um, although it's still early days and the, uh, the prelim preliminary estimates will continue to come in. So that sets the stage for Sunday's meeting. And don't worry, I won't get in and read the, the entire slide to you. Uh, but again, I think a couple of things to note coming in. First, the meeting's on a Sunday, which is unusual. It's not a work day. Uh, you know, in 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 the Middle East or in Vienna, um, this meeting was just recently moved to being a virtual meeting, um, and I think one of the things that's interesting here is that two months ago the date of this meeting was set to be December fourth, knowing that as it was already apparent and scheduled that the EU embargo and the G seven price cap would take effect the following day. It therefore seems to me that the intent of this meeting was to wait, you know, to provide the group with space to say, these things haven't taken effect yet. We need to give ourselves a month of watching how the market responds to, you know, the EU embargo and to the G7 price cap before we decide how we are going to engage with that. Um, so, you know, there's been speculation over the past week, you know, would the group increase production? Um, there were press reports suggesting that might be the case, which was immediately followed by an official Saudi press agency statement on behalf of the uh, oil minister saying, no, and in fact, we might cut if the market needs us to do that. So, you know, where it goes from here, um, we will see. Um, by the way, another issue that has been tabled is, given the reality that a number of members aren't able to even produce at their target, should the group reallocate individual quotas to be more in line with underlying reality? Uh, those tend to be pretty contentious discussions. We will have to wait and see whether that, that line of discussion bears fruit. To me, one of the key points though is, does the group choose to be reactive or proactive? Um, you know, the timing of this meeting suggests to me that for now the group is trying to be reactive. That is to say, wait and see how these things play out. That's not where the group has been in recent months. Uh, in fact, as recently as October, the big cut that was announced at that meeting was with the intent of being proactively anticipating a potential weakening of the market and heading it off. So is the group going to remain in a mode of being proactive or is it switching to a more reactive discussion? 
Um, of course, there's broader context, and Toro will discuss some of this. You know, uh, but you know, with COVID-related shutdowns in China, with the risk of recession uh, threatening oil demand as well in the U.S. and in Europe, you know, how does uh, the group start to engage? Um, I thought one interesting wrinkle at the October meeting was that the group actually said, um, well, we're going to cut production so that we have more spare capacity, you know, so that if something goes wrong, then we can react to it. That's an interesting uh, construct. And I, I personally would like to explore with Toral uh, and Christoph the kind of the meaning of inventories versus potentially spare capacity in terms of who gets to decide how to manage potential volatility in the marketplace. And then finally, as you see from the pictures, um, none of us are naive enough to think that these decisions are actually made on a purely technical basis. Um, oil has been and always um, uh, remains an intensely political commodity, you know, and you know, these decisions are based on a combination of economic and political factors. Um, with that, let me wrap up and invite Toral uh, to, uh, to take over with some market context. Thank you, Mark, and uh, for having me today. Uh, it's very interesting time indeed. And uh, I'll try to just provide a little bit of context and, and go through how we see things still market working out uh, with this major events uh, in the coming days. So if you can just get up my slide deck. Uh, do you have it? Great. Can you see it, Toral? No, I do not see it. Oh, my apologies. Let me... Um... Uh, give me a moment. Uh, I'm sorry, folks. Uh, that my technical uh, capabilities are uh, defeating defeating our best efforts here. Here we go. Uh, that's it, right? Yeah, that's it. All right. Yes. So, so just go to the first slide. So, even with these two major events coming up in the market in the next 48 hours, as as you said, we have seen. Uh, a major easing in oil prices over the past, uh, over November and, and October. We have the OPEC cuts taking effect uh, in, in November. We have another OPEC meeting coming, and we have this massive potential disruption uh, to Russian supplies um, with the embargo taking effect on, on, on Monday and still no uh, formal announcement on the price cap uh, that, uh, that uh, we've seen coming out. Um, I have you have to excuse me if it came out in the past hour or so as a way, but we are seeing um, so crude prices down back to pre-war levels, gasoline prices the same. We're seeing diesel um, prices, even though coming down from the really high levels we saw over summer and again in October when we had refinery strikes in France, remaining really high uh, on historical level and what's holding up the complex. And what we're seeing for us is now it's really the economic concerns and the concerns over oil demand growth with renewed lockdowns in China that is the major focus of the market for now and some uh, easing of the supply tensions in the physical markets. So if we go to the next slide. Uh, so on the demand side, obviously, um, the economic forecast, the, the outlook has deteriorated throughout the year and demand growth forecast the same. Uh, of course, we have cut our, our demand forecast for 2022 from 3 million expected at the start of the year to 2 million now as the GDP outlook has, um, has deteriorated and also because of more extended lockdowns in China. And this has really been weighing on market sentiment. And what we're seeing though also, it's over the course of the year, at, uh, we're seeing demand growth slowing from five at the start, obviously from them taking into account the baseline changes uh, over 2021. But in the fourth quarter, our forecast is for a contraction in global oil demand compared to a year ago and really slow growth uh, at the start of 2023. Uh, we are assuming a recovery in oil demand in, in 2023. And this is something I'd be interested to, to talk about. Uh, because we are assuming a gradual reopening of China, which underpins a lot of that growth that they were expecting of 1.6 million barrels a day next year. It might be looking chunky when we see the situation today. And it's really only China and jet fuel recovery, a continuous jet fuel recovery that is, is underlying our demand growth forecast, where you're seeing major uh, 
uh, developed economies and, and tra road transport fuels contracting to slower economic growth and higher prices um, for the forecast period. So if we go to the next slide, uh, and this is coming at the time where we're seeing also the supply uh, trend shifting um, over the past, uh, since mid 2020, obviously we've seen a very strong and steady recovery in oil's global oil supply as the OPEC cuts were unwound, as US supply recovered. Just in the six, past six months, we saw three more than 3 million barrels a day of growth in global oil supply, uh, Saudi Arabia, US, uh, recovering to, to pre-pandemic rates. But uh, from November from, from, from November and through the end of the year, we're expecting a loss of a million barrels a day as the OPEC cuts that, um, that you mentioned in your introduction. Uh, we have a similar view about the million barrels a day decline, a little bit less perhaps, uh, from the OPEC plus uh, countries. And as the uh, import um, ban on uh, e from EU countries on Russian crude takes effect. I'll talk a little bit more about the Russian assumptions in a second. Um, but just to say 2022, we're still looking at, at growth in global oil supply of more than 3 million barrels a day. Um, Oh, 4.6 million barrels a day, three, more than 3 million from OPEC, and 1.6 from Saudi Arabia alone. And I think we should remember this uh, when we talk about cutting back supply. So Saudi Arabia is adding more supply in 2022 than all of the non-OPEC plus countries combined. So for next year, it's a slightly different picture. Uh, of course, our forecast uh, is not factoring in a change in OPEC um, plus um, targets going forward. This assumes that the OPEC targets stay as, as they are with the capacity constraints and, and the declines in those countries uh, that we are, where we're seeing a stabilization um, of oil supplies through uh, the 2023. So if you go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more. Um, well, we can we can go quickly through, through this one. I, I think you covered this very, very nicely. Um, but I just put in one slide here to, to, to show how, uh, you know, at, at the start of 2021, Russia was producing more than Saudi Arabia. And now with that growth we see in Saudi Arabia and Russia falling back, uh, there is quite a large uh, difference uh, with Saudi reaching record high production and, and, and Russia declining from those levels that we saw last year. So just go to the next slide and talk a little bit more about Russia. Because obviously Russian uh, production and exports have been holding up quite, uh, quite strongly since uh, the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, in October, uh, exports were 7.7 were .7 million barrels a day, only about four or 500,000 barrels a day below pre-war levels. And preliminary indications for the November suggest that exports held up. Uh, there are signs that Russia is pushing out as much oil as, as it can to the market before those embargo takes effect. But what we can see is, is that major shift uh, in, um, in destination, the reallocation of trades that we talked a lot about. But if we just go to the next slide, uh, where we can see that is EU, even though EU has really scaled back, uh, they've done, done a good job replacing uh, Russian euros in its refining system and cutting back um, now, in October, the, the Russian imports were down by about a million barrels, but, uh, but EU still accounted for a third of Russian oil export. Uh, so we still have quite a, a, a big way to go. And of course, um, from Monday, um, uh, the crude oil, the remaining crude oil coming to Europe is going to be paced up, not all of it. Uh, the latest numbers were about a million and a half uh, barrels um, a day of Russian oil coming to Europe, about roughly half of that coming through the pipeline, Drushba pipeline, half seaborne. Um, and are, of course, uh, some of the Drushba pipeline flows also have to, to stop. Uh, only Czech Republic, Slovak Republic, Hungary has exemptions uh, from the import ban, but only for the crude, uh, for the product, if they're supplying the domestic market, they're not allowed to export any products to other markets. Uh, from Euros crude. So we could see a little bit of adjustment there too. 
So our assumption is that there's about 800,000 barrels a day of crude coming seaborne to, to the EU countries uh, before the embargo takes effect. And we think that with the tanker uh, capac capacity availability in the market uh, and um, this crude should be able to find uh, new markets in Asia, maybe not immediately, it might be a bit bumpy. There's been a lot of uncertainty about the price cap and about insurance and there might be some logistics uh, issues to work out. Um, but we think that the crude should be relatively easy uh, Rediverted to new markets. Um, we do think that some of that crude oil that goes through the northern leg of the Drushba pipeline to Germany, to, to France, and to, to Poland uh, might have difficulties, logistical issues to get that to port and, and export it. So we do expect uh, a reduction in crude oil exports and, and, and also production of about 400,000 barrels a day from December, say January. And as you can see here, so the question is who's going to take uh, who's going to take the Russian crude? Um, as you know, you can see from the chart here that really the biggest change has come from India, who who accounted for very little, took very little Russian oil before um, before this year, and now we're importing about eight nine hundred thousand barrels a day, maybe as much as a million. Question is if how much more they would be willing to take. Uh, they're already at the 20% uh, of their feedstocks coming from Russia now. Uh, we haven't seen a major change in, in China as of yet. Uh, the, the, the Russian crude, um, there's both pipeline, obviously, and um, seaborne crude going to China. But also because Chinese refinery runs have fallen this year, it's a little bit hard to estimate how, uh, what kind of appetite China uh, will have for Russian crude. Uh, once those refiners come back. So far, the, the interest from Chinese refiners have been the independents and not the, the national, the major um, uh, Chinese refining companies. Uh, this might change once there is some more clarity uh, from the government on, on what they're doing. Yeah. And also Turkey. But uh, what we're seeing, though, is that it's really only Turkey, India, and China that remains the market now for Russian crude. And the question with the discount that have been offered, there hasn't been a lot of interest from other buyers. So this is a question and how much of a dependence uh, these countries and others uh, would want to have from, um, from Russia. So the second, the second leg uh, where we're seeing is really the February product uh, uh, import ban from Europe that we think will be more complicated uh, there's about a million, uh, and there's more than a million barrels still of Russian oil products coming into Europe. Uh, we haven't seen a major reallocation of, of Russian product flows as of yet. Europe has sourced a lot more distillates from other markets, from the Middle East uh, and even the US. Uh, but this has been more to meet an increased demand and, and refinery, uh, lower refinery supply in the region due to strike and maintenance and outages and so forth. And Russian diesel flows has held relatively steady. So our question is, um, and so our assumption then is that uh, it will be more complicated to reallocate the, the product flows. Uh, we haven't seen it. it it's uh, without access to, to EU maritime services uh, for the reallocation, there's a big question mark. And, um, it's it's not as we saw back in um, in March April when the U.S. Uh, banned imports from Russia. Uh, one part uh, we saw that Russian refiners had to cut runs immediately as they don't have storage uh, uh, for these products. And um, just just um, so 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 just to say um, so for the Russians even if they find markets uh, and available tanker capacity for their diesel they would also have to find markets for the naphtha uh, for the fuel all, all the products have to be able to be to find new markets outside of the EU um, so our assumption is that the, the Russians uh, will cut runs um, uh, to uh, as a result of the embargo. And we're expecting losses of about 1.9 million in total uh, by the, the first quarter of, of next year. So that's what a million four more than today. 
Uh, but obviously a lot of uncertainty around these numbers. We've seen uh, a, quite a, a big reallocation today. But just one note before, before I, I finish, uh, if there isn't an increased buying from Turkey, China and India uh, come uh, the, in the coming months, uh, when EU um, cuts back the import, it means that the, the other uh, importers would have to triple their volumes compared to volume to, uh, to, to their current volumes. Uh, other imports, it's outside, there will be none. The, outside of those distinctioned areas and those three countries, uh, they would have to go from about a million barrels a day of imports in total today uh, to 3.3, 3.4. So it's quite the major uh, efforts required. So we can just flip to the next one. Uh, um, uh, but even so, even with the losses from Russian supplies um, that we're expected, are expecting to see, and with lower OPEC production, um, the, the weaker demand outlook really means that we're seeing uh, a surplus uh, in the market in the second half of 2022. And I think that aligns a little bit what we're seeing on the pricing side today uh, and into, uh, into the, the fourth quarter and even in the start of 2023, the markets look rel relatively adequately supp supplied, finely balanced, I would say. Second half of the year, uh, assuming that, that China does reopen uh, and if OPEC cut stays in place, uh, it, we're looking at the different stories. But the point we wanted to make that with all this change of trade flows, uh, shipping, instead of shipping uh, from producers to consumers four or five days, now we're going to take 40 days, 50 days, and back and forth. Um, the, it, it, the, 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 the risk of supply disruptions are increasing. And um, with inventories uh, where they are currently, um, that could create uh, continued volatility in the market. So if we just go to my last slide, where we're seeing, and so for the latest official data for the OECD, we see that uh, there's still 4 billion barrels today, uh, 4 billion barrels uh, of, of OECD inventories, which is quite a lot, but that's quite, uh, if, if you can just look at the right-hand uh, side of, of the graph there, how sharply that have come down over the past 18 months. Um, and if you see, if we just look at the ind industry stocks, uh, we have seen uh, a stabilization and even a slight increase in 2022. Um, but this is obviously come at the expense of, of the, the very big sharp draw drawdown of uh, government stocks, uh, more than 200 and uh, more than 200 million barrels of government stocks have been released uh, since March in, OEC, in IEA countries, either through the IEA collective actions or from the US individually uh, or in France because of well, logistics and, and supply disruptions there. And so we're seeing that even with the, all this government stocks hitting the market, industry stocks still remain well below the five-year average. So um, question, if we didn't have these government stocks, it would have been even a much tighter tighter situation. And while it's looking a bit more comfortable than it did uh, at the start of the year and the end of 2021, 20, with so much uncertainty in the market on both the demand side and the supply side, uh, and so many different factors, those buffers um, are, you know, they remain low. And as you, as you pointed, now we don't the OPEC spare capacity and, and inventories, that's that's a balance uh, with both being relatively low. Uh, the buffers remain uh, quite thin in such an uncertain environment. So I leave it there. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Toral. I appreciate that that comment. Christoph, let me uh, turn to you. But while I'm trying to figure out the comment I, or, or the my, get my technology straight, um, one thing I wanted to just just flag, you know, kind of following up on Toral's commentary about inventory, there have been some uh, industry analysts who have said, well, uh, don't worry, inventories at sea have gotten dramatically bigger, you know, with the implication of saying, don't worry, that oil will eventually show up at, you know, at, at consuming markets. But as you pointed out, the fact that 
uh, changing oil flows mean that we're you know sending oil over longer distances than had been the case. Essentially, just means that that's a permanent step change in the amount of oil needed just to maintain the system's functioning, and not an indication of impending uh, looseness in the market. So um, here, let me then uh, see if I can get myself toggled back over uh, to uh, the um, whoops. Sorry, my apologies. The technology continues to defeat me. Um, the uh, next version should be here. Uh, just a moment, please. Sorry, folks. Uh, this is uh, you know Mark Finley, not the technology guy. Uh, you know, speaking with you today. <laughs> so, okay, Christoph, there. Is everyone up uh, and showing uh, the data? Can you see it okay? Christoph, I think you're on mute. Another tech guru. So good morning, everyone. And Mark, thank you for setting this up. The best part is we don't need the slide right now, but leave it there, please. <laughs> Uh, so I'm, I'm supposed to cover the, uh, the price cap while the European energy ministers are still negotiating. The price cap, as you all know, is supposed to be a major plank in the sanctions regime. So I think the way I'll, I thought the way I'll do this is to first, uh, in three steps, first to have a very brief look at the actual economic situation in Russia that is uh, at the effect of the sanctions which we had so far. Then a very, an even briefer look at the sanction regime and then to discuss in somewhat more detail the price cap and what's right or what's wrong with it. And now I would have said, here's the slide, <laughs> which, which is useful to come to a very quick and rough and ready assessment of what is actually going on in Russia now, uh, nine months after the invasion and after the sanction regime has been introduced. These numbers here are interesting because they are not official government data. This is from an opinion poll of Russian economists which the central bank is still able to conduct and carry out. So these numbers are sort of as close as you can possibly get of what informed people would think about the Russian economy who know it better than people from outside this economy. Should be as, I'm not saying it's unbiased, but as unbiased as possible. Uh, the way to read it is concentrate, if you look uh, on top on the horizontal line, concentrate on the year 2022 and maybe 2023. I think under present circumstances, one should not go into longer term forecasting. And then uh, in the column for 2022, for example, you see brackets below each number. These brackets are interesting also in their own right because these are the same answers to the same questions or the same numbers two months ago. So we see rough and ready when we compare the brackets with uh, today's answers, changes are not very dramatic, so it looks pretty stable and changes are all in, in an upward direction. The, the situation becomes better in terms of the economy become, performs better than expected two months ago. Just a few highlights here, start on the nominal side. Inflation uh, expected for this year to be 12.5%, declining rapidly. Uh, to next year and by now I think it's already at 10 percent. In line with that of course interest rates expected to continue to come down. The central bank in a powerful position where it has the potential to loosen up a little bit and if you now jump down a little and you look at nominal wages then you see a figure here for the year on average 10.6 percent. This is now the first important conclusion. The difference between nominal wages and inflation is about two percent. It's a real wage loss of 2%. This is not the kind of income loss which triggers revolutions even in, say, Italy, you know, which people like to demonstrate. In Russia, and given the circumstances, this is a very, very small decline in income which will not register as big social tensions. Uh, if you add to that the unemployment rate, you see that the unemployment rate expected for this year is even better than it was last year. So again, uh, not an immediate picture of an economy where people suffer. Uh, you add to that the exchange rate and you see that the ruble has actually appreciated still now, even though it's coming down a little bit. You need 68 or expected 68 ruble per dollar in 2022 compared to 73. And that of course is the effect of what we have seen continued hydrocarbon and other commodity exports at high prices and almost no imports. 
of many of the things that uh, which Russia had to curtail, making for a huge current account surplus and therefore for upward pressure on the exchange rate. Has all sorts of side effects. If you look, for example, at the Russian stock exchange, you see it has come down since the invasion. But if you look at it in dollar terms, it's practically even and has, it has even recovered somewhat. So what that suggests, and I'm making no statement about the long-term impact of sanctions, is that when you just look at the macro data, you don't worry about technology transfer. You don't worry about uh, planes falling from the skies because they don't have spare parts to all of that. Then the expectations of those who should know best for this year and next are of a relatively moderate impact of the sanctions, relatively moderate decline in GDP, 3.5% this year, 2% next year relatively small suffering in terms of wage losses and a, an improving situation, not a deteriorating situation. But not all is well, of course, as we know. I mentioned already some of the things which will have long-term effects. Uh, financial sanctions will also have long-term effects, but more importantly is the lack of technology transfers, the lack of ability of producing white goods plus all kinds of transport. And then um, one, of the, one of the issues I want to point out separately without a slide is the massive uh, flight of well-educated young people, which we have observed over the last few months. I don't single it out in slides because the numbers are all over the place from a few hundred thousand to, uh, to I heard numbers of a million. And it's also not clear to what an extent they drift in and out, to what an extent they still work in Russia and come back. But um, I'm talking to you now from Abu Dhabi and me and my friends, for example, refer to Dubai only as Casablanca uh, because of the old movie where Casablanca was sort of attracting all sorts of people drifting around. And so it's full of Russians trying to you know, establish a life, getting bank accounts, getting visas, uh, getting, getting a place to live. It is really very, very visible. And these are people who sit in coffee shops on computers. These are not people who, who would, you know, for, uh, can go for social welfare. And another uh, picture, which I think is worth looking at as an indicator, Mark, if you can move to the next one, is, uh, is this one here. There is a, it's only on first sight an apparent uh, contradiction. There's an increasing tendency towards de-dollarization in Russia. So people apparently go into the ruble. If you look at the picture, it shows you the share of dollar denominated bank accounts versus ruble denominated bank accounts. And it looks strange because it looks as if people now all want to have ruble bank accounts, but that's of course an illusion. What this really reflects is capital flight. This is money withdrawn from the banks and stuffed into suitcases in cash and carried out by these very people I was just referring to. And that is, if anything, a clear indicator that there's a gap between the confidence of the population that and the, and the flight numbers uh, over the medium and the long term and their willingness to transfer money out despite the very strong ruble uh, and the actual situation when you just look at the macroeconomic figures as every so often the macro figures itself don't tell you the whole story. So Mark, I think we can do away with the slides. So let me move to the second part. First part we say on the numbers, a very stable macroeconomic situation on what we observe, what we read in the newspaper, what we see, follow the money, a slightly more nervous picture. Now, before we go into the price cap, it should also, and let me just make a few more remarks, as also everyone know, is we have what can be legitimately described as a state of economic warfare between the G7 and the European Union on one side and Russia on the other side. Uh, that was something which has started even in 2014 with the annexation of Crimea, but right after the invasion. And it was something which was prepared by the US, by Europe, so which doesn't come as a surprise. You can look up the definition of economic warfare. I won't, don't want to waste time on it, but it, it fits the bill perfectly well. Now, what has happened so far has been largely concentrated, number one, on isolating uh, and taking out of economic circulation people, including freezing their assets. That was the campaign against oligarchs. Number two, on tackling trade flows with embargoes against import exports of all sorts of goods. Number three, on the financial sector with the initial move of confiscating the Russian Central Bank Reserve, something completely unprecedented, but also with taking Russia out of the SWIFT system and limiting uh, in an increasing fashion, the number of Russian banks who can do any transactions at all. And then number four, uh, 
the things which we're going to discuss, sanctions against the, against the energy sector. Step back a little bit and look at the dimensions of this. I said the European Union plus the G7, there's an overlap of three countries, but if you do the numbers, this is the group which actively tries to have this economic warfare against Russia, represents more than 50% of global GDP. Russia, on the other hand, if you only look at energy, not at commodities as a whole, represents about 15% of commercially traded energy, Russian exports. We never had anything like that. Of course, you need that energy to get to the 50% share of GDP. Right? So it's a, it's a tricky situation, but it's really sort of a colossal kind of conflict. And if we now go back to the different areas in which these sanctions have been carried out or these steps have been taken, then it is clear that what happens against persons, against trade, and in the financial sector, I think the big things, the low-hanging fruits, if you want, but also the big items have all been ticked off. They all have been done. The exception is actually energy. Because in energy, we had sanctions against coal. That has more or less been done. We had sanctions uh, and the Russian, Russian reaction in natural gas with respect to Europe. That has largely been done with uh, gas deliveries to Europe drying up. Immediately, the impact becoming visible in the Russian budget, which for the first time is running a deficit because of high military expenditures and, and the lack of gas revenues. And then, uh, of course, this being a pipeline system to a large extent, uh, we have ongoing exports to China, but not the kind of dramatic reshuffling which we've seen in oil. Where it hasn't been done is, and where it hasn't been concluded, is in the biggest item and the biggest revenue bringer for Russia of all of them, which is the global oil markets. In global oil markets, we have seen a number of developments. The first was the opening up of a large discount, as you all know, for Russian crudes over Brent. And that discount, a function initially, I think, of uncertainty and of of the risk of dealing with Russian oil. Suddenly counterparties were gone, banks were uncertain, insurance was hard to come by, nobody knew whom to deal with and what would be next and would be would there be secondary sanctions or not. And so a discount opened up, which is pretty closely following uh, events in the sense that when the world becomes a little bit a quieter place, the discount tends to narrow uh, if new sanctions are discussed new things happening even on the military front the discount tends to widen and so lately with the discussion of the price gap it has started to widen again and then what we have seen is already a massive redirection of oil uh, from russia into asia and also of products from russia into the middle east where they come out as middle eastern products and go into europe that is a trade of the future to to watch for now getting closer to our oil price cap what we have is two key dates one is the 5th of December, which is the point in time when the European Union has announced it will no longer import Russian crude, seaborne crude oil. There's an exception for pipeline oil into Hungary and other places. And the other one is the 5th of February, when the European Union has announced that it will no longer import Russian refined products. That explains sort of some of these movements of crude going into Asia, Middle East and crude going into Europe again, and also of products from Russia going in, or crude also going into the Middle East and somehow miraculously the number of products coming from the Middle East into Europe going up very fast. But I want to concentrate now on the current discussion uh, of the oil price cap, about which the, we still don't have a number with the European Union ministers still negotiating. And truth and advertising, I'm personally of the uh, convinced that this is a very silly idea that is not productive and that it doesn't help the case of, uh, of hurting Russian revenues by economic warfare. It's an example of the kind of battle one should not pick because in economic, like in other warfare, I'm reading one should pick battles which are winnable and this one doesn't seem to be a battle which is easy. Linked. So what is, what is happening here? Best to start it by going back in time a little bit. When the European, and this is interesting how this, how this discussion of the price gap emerged, it emerged ultimately, I think, because the European Union was afraid of its own courage to some extent. When the European Union uh, published its, its uh, sanction package number six, in which it said we will embargo Russian crude, Russian seaborne crude imports into Europe, it also published, can you still hear me? Because I just see Mark frozen. Oh, no, okay. can, we can hear you. Okay. It also published, it also published a directive saying, that uh, Russian exporters should no longer be able to use European Union-based ship shippers, insurances, and financing tools for maritime trade. 
Britain. And I think they just probably realized too late what that actually meant, because it became obvious pretty quickly that Russia plus its Asian customers didn't have enough ships, didn't have the financial sector infrastructure necessary to finance these trades, and in particular didn't have these huge pools of uh, liquidity necessary to have an insurance system for these large uh, crude oil deliveries. And so the European Union quick, quickly had to realize that actually implementing their own, their own legislation would mean a decline in Russian exports because the infrastructure wasn't there of an unknown magnitude. People were speculating the IA at the time said three or three and a half even million barrels per day. Goldman said one million barrels per day. So somewhere in between. And with that decline in crude oil exports, of course, would come an increase in global oil prices, which the European Union was keen to avoid. Enter the oil price cap. It's interesting. I don't know whether it was floated in response to that situation, but my memory is it was actually a proposal of the Treasury before that conflict program. It was floating around as an idea sort of uh, rather vague and a pretty blunt instrument saying, okay, we need to Avoid, we need to impose a cap and, and enforce it somehow, but there was no obvious enforcement mechanism. And accordingly, the idea of an oil price cap initially gained no traction. Nobody was really impressed by that. And it was just pushed by uh, treasury officials occasionally, uh, but it, it wasn't adopted by anyone. It didn't have any, as far as I remember, uh, vivid defenders. But here, of course, was a match made in heaven because that oil price cap was A, a way out for the European Union of its dilemma, and B, suddenly merged, evolved from a rather obscure and blunt instrument into the shiny cornerstone of a very sort of almost like precision ammunition in terms of targeting Russian oil revenues. How did this happen? All the European Union had to do was to amend its legislation and say, from now on, you can use our infrastructure, our ships, our finances, and our insurances if the oil which is transported in this way is then sold below the price ceiling. And, uh, and, and that supposedly was the best of all world. All of a sudden, you could, in, in the first version, enforce Russia, a price cap on Russia without limiting uh, its export volume. So that means keep prices, keep the costs of the consumer stable, but hurt the revenue of Russia, the ideal world. And in the second and more refined version, you could force Russia, so to speak, to pay a toll for using this infrastructure. And that toll would then be equivalent to a loss in revenues, again, without hurting the consumers. Now, if you take that logic seriously, already the first flaws in design appear. So why is it not possible? And, and, and I kid you not, this is, this is in the legislation. Even if uh, something is transported and sold at the cap, Russia is not allowed to sell it into the European Union because the European Union embargoes and the embargo overrides the price cap. So if you really wanted to you know, not disrupt the global system, keep oil prices constant and make it difficult for Russia, why would you force them to ship it three times the shipping time, as Marcus said, at a much higher price into Asia? Why would you not allow them to just ship it into, into Europe? That's a design flaw, never mind. It could be corrected, has not been yet corrected. But there are more substantial issues with that proposal. And I will just list three of them and then leave it to the discussion. The first one is that this price cap idea introduces something which is sort of a horror for any economist. It introduces multiple prices for a very homogeneous good, which is oil. We will have three prices to deal with. There will be a global price for uh, crude blends which are not affected by production or consumption and transport related to Russia, such as Brent or WTI. Secondly, there will be a market price about a discount price for Russian oil, for euros. And thirdly, there will be the price cap for which we still have no idea what it actually is. And when you have these three prices, there are some predictions you can make, but the key prediction I would make is that life becomes so messy that you will and that we'll encounter the law of unintended consequences pretty fast. And, uh, and energy, that's, that's really a good idea. A few things we can say, for example, the lower, the bigger the distance between the price cap and the global price for Brent or for WTI, the larger the incentive to cheat. Secondly, the price cap obviously should be below the discounted price. But since it is a price cap and since it's a very liquid situation and it's not supposed to change all every five minutes, it is quite conceivable that the discounted price falls below the price cap, which means that, uh, that, that people will sort of 
completely just that it will become a completely and entirely meaningless. Yeah? And there's a few other configurations which you can make. One of the consequences has not been figured large in the discussion, which is again the lower the price cap is, and if it is substantially below the discount, or so the more the Indias and Chinas of this world are capable of buying crude at this price cap, including the two and a half million which are not supposed to go to Europe anymore, the bigger their competitive advantage uh, of their industry and their consumers compared to the prices which are being paid in the US and in Europe, in the G7 and the European Union. So there's all sorts of wrinkles here which come from this constellation and uh, having multiple prices for this good with the market which was still capable of balancing them quite well is I think a recipe for a great, as we see, for a great period of, of confusion in which, we, in which we enter. Secondly, more to the point, it was always part of the sanctions idea to bring down not only Russian prices, but limiting Russian revenues, but also bring down volumes. Why? Because there is the suspicion that uh, Russian production capacity suffers if production volumes fall. Uh, nobody knows exactly where the cutoff is. What we know is two data points. When Russian production collapsed after the collapse of the Soviet Union, it took more than 20 years and huge amounts of Western technology and investment to bring production capacity back up because Russian fields are very different from Middle Eastern fields. So you have large, uh, large, large fields, sorry, but you have lots, uh, 10,000 in the case, it's really literally of fields, which may suffer uh, freezing over, which may suffer water cuts, which are more difficult to fix because there's so many small ones of them. So it was very difficult to bring production volumes back up. The second data point we have, which Mark always points out rightly, is that when COVID hit, uh, Russian production declined by 2 million and they could bring it back up. But somewhere there, maybe below 2 million, is a cutoff point where lower production volumes were thought to damage production capacity in the long term. Initially, that part was always a trigger point for attracting, uh, increasing the attractiveness of sanctions in the oil sector. That has gone completely out of the window. Now we are talking about sanctions which are not painful and costless and uh, supposed to hit only prices which, which should everyone make everyone suspicious. And the third point, which I think is a dangerous one, is the underestimation of the Russian reaction. Russia has made it very clear that if there's a country which adheres to the price cap, they will not deliver oil to it. The EU uh, seems to argue that, oh, no, they won't, and uh, seems to also see that situation as one which is very dramatic. Either Russia cuts its production and has a total collapse, or it doesn't, and therefore it will not. Uh, but I just want to point out two things. Russia did the same and say the same with respect to oil, uh, to gas uh, exports, and they did cut. And secondly, uh, this is not a binary situation. Russia can cut a little bit and can cut a lot. It can cut for six months and it can scale it up. This is like giving President Putin on a silver platter a little bit, uh, a scale with which he can target a Western recession if he wanted to. Mm, scale a little more, I, I cut it for six months, and then if you don't behave, I bring it back up. And the idea is sort of torture in this, in this public information space when people see that their, their oil price costs go up and increase substantially. Mm -hmm. So on balance, this is, to me, an instrument which is, uh, which is not picking a battle which is easily won, number one, and which makes a fundamental mistake in, in, in pretending that there is a free lunch in this business. There is not. There is no such thing as an oil price cut which is costless to us uh, and costly to, to, to Russia. And the point here is that if we talk really about economic warfare, we have to be clear that this is costly, right? just like, like real warfare is costly. And, and there is no such thing as having your cake and, and eating it too. And that is, that is what the situation amounts to. And that is actually much more dramatic than it sounds because that will make sure that people get disappointed and cynical and, and that Russia has probably an easy victory in the information war. How will it continue now? We should not expect European energy ministers to have the courage and walk away from a bad idea when they recognize it, which I think is increasingly the case. We can expect that they are, you know, as usual, coming up with the lowest common denominator as a compromise that would indicate indeed a price in the range of 60. But even though, even if, even if it is then a situation which is not enforced and where nothing really happens, which is, in my view, the most likely outcome, it is not a pleasant one because it wastes a lot of ammunition uh, in a battle which is not winnable. Right. 
Thank you, Christoph. <clears throat> and thanks as well to Toral for your comments. Um, you know, given the complexity and the richness of the issues that we've been plumbing, we've, we've kind of run along on the conversation, but there are time for some questions. Um, and I, I just ask the panelists to kind of keep your answers tight uh, in the interest of managing our time, you know, the little bit of time we have left and honoring the time of our, our, uh, our, our watchers. Um, Toral, a number of questions have come in about how, how do you track you know, the kind of that other, that unknown, the, the gray, the gray market and the ghost ships, uh, given, uh, you know, the mounting uh, sanctions, how, how does the IEA approach the question of, of you know, it had these, these kind of ghost cargoes and how do you manage and track them? Thank you. Um, no, so we, we spend a lot of time uh, tracking the cargoes. And I think uh, for the time being, I don't think we, we can really talk about ghost cargoes. We can talk about uh, EU tankers and, and, and non-EU G7 uh, tankers, but there, there has been a big shift in ownership. Uh, and we're seeing that because, I mean, this is the premise. If you're not going to sell the, the Russian oil in the price cap, then the, the, the EU tankers are off uh, limits. So we've seen some of the ownership shifting to other buyers and other non-sanctioned juris jurisdictions, uh, but that doesn't really mean that, that they're cheating. Um, so for the time being, uh, shipping oil um, to, uh, to, to, to buy, it only has been illegal uh, to ship it to the U.S. Uh, so far. So now with, with the EU coming up, um, uh, of course, they you, you, there might be some more, uh, some Russian oil coming into, I mean, this is not our premise that Russian oil will continue to flow in, into EU on non-Russian uh, tankers or with, without transponders on. Uh, and it will not be illegal uh, for, for Russia to ship on these ghosts, these, these uh, gray tankers, these non-EU tankers. They are not sanctioned. In fact, I think that. There is, there is a need and a willingness to, to, to see that Russian oil flowing to those markets. But just on the question on, on the EU reducing its share and its shipping to other or unknown, uh, I mean, that, that's exactly what we're seeing. There are um, the destination, because we're shipping the oil further away and because of the uncertainty, we don't necessarily have the destination at the time of loading and in the first month. But it's becoming, um, it, it is becoming uh, available with some delay. And, and we see that most of that oil ending up in Asia. So, I mean, the question is now when the embargoes come in, as Christoph was saying, uh, the bigger the discounts, the bigger incentive to cheat. And will there be tankers turning off their transponders? Uh, you know, will there be insurance issues and, and Russian oil and uninsured or, or you know, Yes, we will see that, but I think that with the technology we have today, I mean, we, we do have pretty good visibility on, on where the oil is going. So I'll just leave it at that. Well, fingers crossed, uh, you know, given, the, given the size of the battle. Uh, Christoph, I'm, I'm, Toral, I'm going to guess that the, where I'm going to go with the next kind of two questions stacked on top of each other might be too too politically touchy for you. If you want to join in, that's great. But uh, for Christoph, and again, please, we're, we're at time, so I really want to keep these tight. Um, Christoph, I see kind of emerging tensions between the U.S. and the EU already over energy price spikes. I've seen EU officials complaining about high gas prices. Um, you know, what are the prospects that you know, the oil, but energy more broadly, you know, uh, that, that, you know, the, you, becomes a wedge issue to break up the, 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 the pro-Ukraine coalition. Um, and in a similar vein, how do you see where Saudi Arabia is sitting right now and how they're trying to manage the, not just the oil market dimensions of it, but the geopolitical dimensions of this? And again, the, uh, Toral, if you want to join in, great, but yeah, I don't want to put you on the spot if, if, if you put rather not. So, Christoph. Very briefly on the first one, I think both parties have still too much at stake and are too vested now into, into presenting a unified front. So I think at least for that winter, that will hold. Uh, what would happen if there would be presidential elections and all of that, that's a different story. But for the foreseeable future, despite some bickering, I'm, I think the surprise of show of unanimity will hold. The second one is a loaded question, of course, you know, Saudi Arabia has an interest. I mean, let's just say, 
see how oil markets are changing already, right? It used to be OPEC manipulating supply. Now it's OPEC and the US with its SPR manipulating supply, plus Russia, of course. Now it is all of a sudden prices being fixed as well. Now it is also demand and so get, gets manipulated uh, you know, through, these, through these redirections of trade flows. Uh, and I think that the Middle East has a real golden era, high oil prices, high dollar for their imports. They're really sort of on top of, on top of their game. And as always, probably going a little bit overboard on uh, keeping their own shop, including the plus and OPEC plus together. So I don't think this will hold forever. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, we could go a lot deeper on that. Uh, Toral, I, I don't see you leaning into the camera, you know, wanting to, to join in on either of those points. So I'm going to assume that that we're okay to leave it. Um, the There are a lot of questions uh, that we haven't been able to get to, and that's a testament to, you know, the uh, the interest of, of of the audience, but also, you know, the... Uh, the insights of the speakers, yeah, yeah, as well. So, um, you know, let me uh, wrap up. We're a few minutes over time already, and I want to honor your time, especially on a Friday. Uh, and so, um, lots of stuff to explore. The stakes are high, uh, and we're not out of the woods yet. Yeah, there'll be, you know, as 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 Toro mentioned, you know, will, will there be a next leg of the EU embargo comes February fifth. We have to see how, you know, Russia responds. How does OPEC respond? Where are we going in terms of a recession? You know, will the coalition hold? Um, FYI, uh, one of our uh, attendees just posted something to us that the EU has just announced that it has agreed on a $60 price cap. Um, if that is the case you know, and that takes effect, that's more or less what Russian oil is already selling for at a discount. You know, will Russia refuse to sell volumes under a price cap arrangement? Uh, stay tuned. Uh, you know, the good news about uh, following the oil market and the energy market is that it's always changing, it's always interesting, and it always matters. Uh, you know, uh, please join me in thanking Toral and Christoph, as well as our crack team uh, with the Baker uh, Institute events staff, uh, Serena and Andrew. And most importantly, thanks to all of you for taking time out of your day. We hope you found this conversation to be useful. The slides uh, and related links will be posted to our events website uh, and wishing you a pleasant Friday morning, afternoon or evening, depending on where in the world you're joining us from. Thanks again. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Mark,